uh, with your local Main Street program and make sure that we have an organizational uh, culture that fosters engagement. No volunteer wants to come forward for you to just tell them how they should do their job. We want them to come forward with their ideas, with their stand on it, and take ownership. And also building a program that's worth giving for. So we have to prove, you know, are we creating jobs? Are we, are we increasing sales at our businesses? What are we doing to tell our story and convince people that you are an organization uh, worth giving to? So organization, as I mentioned, covers these points of partnerships, and uh, that's both public and private. Um, it's public relations. We have to tell our story. If the city council only hears from you once a year when you want money, you're going to have an issue with funding down the line. So we have to be there as, as partners with them. And then fundraising. How do we, how do we pay for Main Street programs and all the projects that we do. And then organization lastly covers volunteer development. Not only do we have to have a board, we want to have the board committees, we want to have people that are working on projects uh, as well. So sort of just that PR piece, as I said, the organization committee promotes the organization. So you can do brochures that say, you know, here's why you should get involved, here's what our program is about. And then the other is that the promotion committee promotes the downtown. They do the downtown directories and marketing and doing uh, the events and the festivals as well. And supporting the communities, most of our Main Street programs across the country are 501c3. Um, I always like to keep my eye out on the messages that people have. I love this one that said we're Main Street Believer. Um, and your tax deductible contribution will really help our, our support, uh, support our city, um, just having the means for uh, <laughs> making contributions to an organization. And this is just the typical how main, local Main Street programs are funded uh, throughout the country. Uh, your municipality should be the primary funder of a Main Street program. This is not a project that they get to support you for three years and then they're gone. They should understand that Main Street is doing work on behalf of the city or an economic development organization. So for some of your communities where you don't even have that position in, in your towns and cities, you're playing that role. You're creating jobs. You're increasing the tax base, the value of downtown. You're increasing the quality of life. That is the message the city needs to hear from you. Only about 20 to 30 percent is funded from within the district. Sometimes people say small businesses should be paying for this. It's not a merchant's association. And those small businesses downtown, the best thing they can do is operate a good business and stay open. More money comes in, uh, from outside the community. I mentioned Chip Wall Wall. So why did Google Beard give me $5,000 a year? Cray Research, $5,000. WS Darley, our fire pumper engine company, they all gave me $5,000 a year. My little business is downtown. If I got $250 from them, I was happy. Um, so look outside. And that includes residential. Residents in your community should give. And then about 5 to 15% comes from grants, uh, fundraising activities that you do. We just encourage Main Street programs to have diversified uh, funding sources. And then, the, as I said, the last component is that volunteer um, engagement piece is really creating that sense of ownership, asking people what projects would they like to see taken on in the downtown, and, uh, and really uh, work at it that way. See? So everything that Main Street does also offers that point for engagement. You'll hear that uh, through the committee work. And so I'm going to turn it over to Gary to talk about Vermont. Uh, I'm going to reinforce some of what Kathy talked about. Um, as I mentioned, we, we support, at the state level, we support these organizations and uh, they're all at different levels, right? Um, Summer is just getting started, um, all volunteers, um, others have been around for 25 years. So we have to be folks um, at different places where they are and help them on that journey. No, you know, there's no bad place to start um, unless you don't get anything going, that's not good. Uh, so as, as um, Kathy mentioned, um, you know, here's the four point approach. I think she's touching all this, so there's a slide. In the, So, you know, 
if you are getting started, I'm trying to understand you know, who who are you like as a community, like understanding you know who you are and where you want to go. Um, if you're establishing an organization, what kind of organization do you want to you feel like you need to have? Um, and this, there's no one size fits all. Um, you know, in Vermont, we see everything from um, a select board or the equivalent of a city council of towns and public select boards. Uh, you know, saying we believe that this is important. Um, so we're going to appoint a commission uh, for those who are not like a good place to get started. They might not actually be a formal nonprofit for 501c3. That might be something that they're working towards. But just getting like you know the people initially being appointed and kind of help with this effort, and then you can kind of move towards uh, maybe getting a nonprofit status so that you can uh, have the benefit of receiving funding. Um, you know, most of the organizations that we work with are 501c3. Um, there are a couple, um, you know, chamber type kind of crossbreed organizations, um, and then there's some that, you know, there's a couple that aren't nonprofit at all, and they have to depend on having a fiscal agent to help them uh, with the situation. Seems to be the biggest challenge. <laughs> ah. We can change that. Uh, we didn't say the technology challenges and patriots too. Um, so I can't emphasize enough how important it is to get buy-in, not just from the local champion who believes that you know they have the best neighborhood, the best industry, but to really get the buy-in from the cross-sector of folks. And one of the key partners is is getting the municipal buy-in. Uh, because a lot of the work that you're gonna be doing is gonna cross over into the public debate. Um, cross over with the functions of government, um, you know, the properties that they may have. And so it's really important to get that municipal buy-in. Um, Kathy touched on, like, you know, also not just getting their buy-in, but getting their financial support. Uh, in Vermont, we actually, as the Vermont Downtown Program, um, if they're going to be accepted into our program, we require them to have a downtown organization, like I just described, but we also require there to be a municipal contribution. We don't tell them how much. Although sometimes I wish we would, um, but you know, it, it ranges from community to community. Some of our downtowns are very small, uh, others are much larger or relative. So the, the level of contribution they can offer is very, very greatly. But you do need a local champion, um, someone who can be that engine, at least initially, and then you do need that municipal um, buy and support. And then you can't just depend on volunteers alone. Um, at some point, you need to get staff on board. Um, and it may just be a part-time staff working 10 hours a week in some situation, but they may have some possible full-time position or multiple staff, depending on your situation. Um, but it's really important to have kind of the structure of the organization. And it's not just volunteers running in different directions because Bob has a full car, and, you know, I'm partial. Um, so having that structure and having a makeup of your board that really is the makeup of your community too. So you want to get representatives on your board who are running businesses. Um, you know, ideally you get someone who is a you know, property owner who kind of has a strong voice of the stakeholder in town, having resident, um, you know, the diversity of, of the makeup of your community, whatever that diversity of your community is, you can be represented on your board. I know we have a number of our downtown organizations that are that are really trying to work through through that into their bylaws and, and, and the power we bring to people on board, not just the first person that raises their hand, but the meeting a need that the organization has. So I think the makeup of a board um, can be really important. Um, and so just looking at you know what that means for your community, what works best. And then, you know, uh, Kathy touched on this, you know, having volunteers get involved and what they want to be involved in, like, why are they, like, I should have mentioned this before, but like, why do you want to be involved? What is it that you're going to contribute to, you know, these efforts? Um, and then the volunteers all can get excited about one or two things that they really are passionate about. Well, you know, try to steer them towards the things that they're happy about, less towards the things that they don't really like to do. Um, you know, you try to uplift them and keep them on board. I think, you know, recognizing volunteers, a lot of our programs with annual recognitions and give awards or appreciation, and that can be tied to, um, you know, an organizational event that you might have celebrated for that year, 
And then while you're doing that, you can also recruit additional volunteers. So it's kind of a perpetual cycle of like appreciation, recognition of the work you're doing, recruiting new volunteers, maybe you're losing a couple, um, but that constant recognition of the work and the value of um, these volunteers contribute to the organization is really important. Um, now, this isn't the responsibility of the organization committee, but as a whole of an organization, there's lots of different types of things that we are involved with. Um, and it is going to vary. You know, it is kind of around the core of the four points, like we're, we're hitting on here today. Um, but there might be something really unique and specific in your organization that needs to pay attention to, um, like housing was brought up, that your, your organization might find a role. Maybe not as a lead, but as a participant in the conversation on housing, or now it's becoming more and more around fire resiliency. They might not be the lead, but they need to participate in those conversations and they make sure they're looking out for, um, you know, for their constituents. Um, as I point out, this is spelling in Washington, where I used to, used to live. <laughs> um, and then, once again, like in order to build a good strategic plan, you can't just make it have active and say, we think these things are important. Um, it really is important to be kind of dive in and look at different ways to engage the community. And it, it can be done for a variety of different ways from, from doing online surveys, um, you know, going to the clipboards to the farmer's market, to having stress, um, you know, either professionally led or eulogy or these types of events where you're really trying to get an idea like what's important to the community, what's working well, what's not. You know, as an organization, how are we doing? Are we serving your community well? Or are we missing the mark? I'm really trying to, um, you know, do this on a, you know, somewhat regular basis. It's not like it is every year, but like every, every few years, I think it's important to kind of engage and really kind of dial in the work that you're doing to help support your strategic plan. So then developing a plan that's based around that input you're getting uh, from the community, from your business owners and property owners. Um, and it's also a good reminder that you can't be everything to everyone. You, this is, I, I think, a fault of many of us who work in mainstream. You say you have to do all that, and then find yourself doing, you know, way too many different things, and then we lose focus of what it is that we're really trying to do. And so, um, I've been practicing that in my work as well, and just saying no, and then it starts to feel really good. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, or that's a really good point because you we all, all can get folks coming to you telling you what you should do. And one strategy that I've learned to um, develop is that's a really good idea. Would you be willing to help me do that? And then you get silence. You know, but you know, you can be honest with folks. You can't you can't do it all. Uh, you need to really rely on other people. If you're really interested in we value that too, you should get involved with our organization. Um, the organization might be doing. And then really boil it down and prioritize what is important. Um, you know, whether it's working on beautification efforts or, or, or promoting events or you know, promoting shopping or whatever it might be, um, you can really kind of narrow down and prioritize that on an annual basis and then adjusting it, adjusting like a five-year strategic plan into an annual plan. Um, and I, I can't stress this enough either. Um, you know, I tell folks I'm going to work with the Department of Housing and Development. We run this Vermont Downtown Program. We have some money, but we have friends that have money and friends that have resources, and we all kind of we all depend on each other. Um, and so, really developing those relationships. I think half of my time is spent developing and, and maintaining the relationships and communicating. Um, it's really I talked to a few of you this morning and just like you know. Who are, who are partner organizations who are trying to be conveners for their neighborhoods. It's a lot of work to communicate, but it's really important. If you don't do it, then, then sometimes work's happening in silos um, and you're not getting the best outcome that you're looking for. So, um, this is just an example of some of the types of partnerships that you might have uh, as an organization. Uh, and then, yeah, I, do, I just want to point out a few of the areas that you, um, Kathy pointed out, kind of the bigger buckets um, for for funding in Vermont, where we find, which I mentioned, the municipal uh, funding is an important piece. Uh, sponsorship, and we we like to encourage folks to not just think about sponsoring an event like one time, but trying to get businesses and corporations to be like a sustaining sponsor that they can take. You know, can you do this for three years? 
like offer them like a package they can't use. Um, and offer something for everybody. It might offer this at a low level for someone who can just participate in that one event, but maybe there's a there's a larger part of the play like a multi-year and get them bought in. I remember when I was in uh, Main Street Vine in New Jersey, um, you know, we worked on getting uh, a sponsor for our volunteer program. And that was something they could get behind, and they were actually willing to give us staff time, not just money. They were like, well, here's some volunteers um, for these three events that we're going to sponsor. Get their energy behind it. Um, event revenue is certainly a source of income for um, myself. Um, uh, don't don't lose money. I always tell people, don't lose money on the internet. If you can create an event, you need to coordinate on it. Try not to lose too much money. There are occasionally there are some lost leaders you have you have to continue to do. Um, but try not to spend too much time or lose too much money organizing events. Um, business support we touched on a little bit. That's that's there, but we're not, we don't want to be too dependent on that that particular piece because we do want business to show the run their business is and not spend a lot of money on us. Um, we have business improvement districts as well, and we're not uh, special improvement districts for our larger communities. It really the taxation on those properties will be a best back in soon. So that the, some of that money will get kicked out to the organization to help them function, and that's that's really a sustainable way of doing it, uh, more accomplishable than you know, the public itself. Um, and then grants, um, obviously, are going to be organization depending on. I just want to point out a few things that we, we help support. Um, for our organizations, uh, and this is a way for us to kind of get them together and to talk, um, share ideas, because we don't want to just be doing things on our own without recognizing that someone else is doing the same thing or something similar or something I can learn from. So, you know, we have monthly, ever since COVID, we were meeting weekly during COVID, and then we started meeting uh, monthly. We've been meeting monthly since uh, the last couple of years with all of our organizations virtually. Uh, for most of the year, and then we do have an annual retreat where we spend you know, a 24, 30 hour day together away from our communities so we can just focus on that year and what's going on specifically. Um, and we do advocacy work, we help elevate uh, what the organizations are doing at the local level. We go to the state house and we, we go into the committee rooms and we, we go onto the house chamber before we get recognized and we give recognition to the work that we're doing. Uh, so it's really important that we, we pat ourselves on the back once in a while and then reinforce to kind of local decision makers and the legislature on why it's important to keep investing. Um, and then we offer our own conferences, programs, and trainings as needed. Almost done here. There's two more things I want to hit on. Um, one is this was a really um, important kind of maturing, I think, of our um, of how we were looking at doing statewide work. You know, I work for the governor, and so. For those of you who work for a city or work for the state, you can't you can't make decisions that aren't supported by the administration. I've gotten myself in trouble sometimes <laughs> for things that like to do that. Um, uh, and then you apologize later. It's not uh, but you know, I, you know, I have to kind of just report the governor's guy and like what the, what the administration is doing. But what we found is I could only push so hard in the legislature. If it was in the governor's budget, I could push for it, but if it wasn't. I had to kind of go around the you know, testify in a different way. And so the Vermont Downtown Coalition was formed, which is made up of our 24 downtowns. And they decided, um, you know, it's like that we decided this was really good to have kind of their voice. They could hire a lobbyist um, with support of the Preservation Trust of Vermont for three years. They got some funding to help them lobby the things that they wanted. Uh, and they were really effective in the very first year, last year, um, they were able to help us with this, which is the downtown virus, which for the first time, well, the first time this is the program has been in existence for 25 years, we actually became a, you know, a, a larger line item in the agency. We have $800,000 in the downtown program to help pay for my salary and to help pay, pay for trainings, and I can offer scholarships to folks who go to trainings, national conferences, and then I can we can then offer up to $25,000 grants to each organization to provide them some capacity funding to help them do the work that they're doing. So with that, we, there always is a couple of things to match, and we allow it as an opportunity for us to say, you know, here's this year's goal. And this year we decided we wanted them all to do a building and business inventory. We wanted them all to do a business and survey. 
and we're going to require them all to do the Main Street um, evaluation, um, even if they don't want to become a Main Street, just so they can at least go through that self evaluation as an organization to figure out where they were, how they could improve. And then they build their own work plan, and then behind part time staff, or increasing the full time, um, or helping to do some promotional um, or design activities. Um, so, this was a game, this is a game changer. We, we have 20 of the 24 grant agreements in place, we've checked for it and gone out. Um, and this is an annual allocation that we're going to plan on doing. We, we do have to get a bit further into the statute because right now it's just a line item in our agency. And as administrations change, we don't want that to be the practice. So we have a little bit of work to do to get that faith in the, the law, but that's a big game changer. I think that's actually the last slide. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, so the next point we're going to cover is is design, and as I mentioned, that really is the physical uh, appearance of the district, and you know everything that will attract or detract uh, from people wanting to come into your main street community. So we want them to not only come and shop, but maybe they'll come and invest, maybe they'll come and choose to live in your uh, community, but it's really important to have uh, a good looking district. And so we want to get it in the top physical condition, build on your existing assets. If it's the historic buildings, what conditions are they in? Sometimes we have facade grant programs. Make sure it's inviting, make sure those public spaces um, are enjoyable. Even the storefront window displays, you know, sometimes Main Street programs do training workshops for their businesses on how to write a good business plan, but also how to do a good visual window uh, display. Uh, and looking at all the public areas, like parking lots and how your uh, street uh, furniture uh, works out. I, have, I don't have this picture in here for this presentation, but I had a picture of a community in Oregon that there were planters which were made out of concrete, like the missing three sides. There was still a round thing in the middle that plants were growing out of, but really, you know, the story <laughs> being told was we don't really care about how, how our downtown looks. And then looking at the signage, you get public signage, finding out the buildings as well, and just landscaping. What are the gateways like uh, to your community? Even wayfinding signage to, to lead people to the, to the heart of your district. Um, so design is really also about educating, educating those property owners on, on the care and maintenance of what good design uh, is for your district. Uh, providing good design advice. In my community, I was fortunate to have five architects uh, who volunteered their time to go out and meet with property owners and tell them about things that they could change to improve their building. Sometimes they'd do a sketch for them. Sometimes they'd offer up color ideas or sign ideas. But we have to give them good advice. And that was not my strength when I started, but I got training in design and felt more confident all along that I could give good advice. Then it's also the planning for downtown. Main streets definitely have to be at the table when cities are redoing master plans and hopefully pushing for a downtown section uh, in their master plans. And then there comes the motivation. How do we entice people to, to make improvements? And sometimes it's just you know, in my downtown, it started out with one person who did a tax credit project. She did a federal rehab tax credit project, took off the ugly split cover, restored it, and it was like it caught fire. And, and people said, wow, that looks fantastic. Now I'm going to take mine down. Um, so just motivating others and maybe having those incentives like facade grants and uh, free design assistance, et cetera. Some states actually have design staff at the state level who do those design renderings, uh, et cetera. So just some design basics. Um, you know, historic districts, as I said, it's our greatest asset, but if you do have a national registered historic district, properties that are contributing within that district can uh, get the 20% federal rehab tax credit. It's a tax credit, it's not a grant. Um, and so they have to get their work approved ahead of time before they do the work, but it's still a 20% uh, rehab grant. And one of the things that we've done when we went marched down the hill last year uh, was to actually ask them to make that 30% uh, for small towns. 
So that hasn't gone into place yet, but that's something we're out there fighting for so that it can be uh, uh, better. But historic districts are, I always say, are honorific, right? People don't want historic districts because they think you're going to tell them what to do with their building. But really, it's just to get them eligible for those federal tax free uh, credits. And then sometimes in some states, you get the brown signs that say historic establishment you know, this way. Uh, so it's it's really just something uh, to promote. Um, just some technology things that have changed over the years in our storefront design. And since glass manufacturing changed, we got rid of the, the pane windows and we could have plate glass windows in buildings. Cast iron was another uh, prominent feature in many communities in those storefronts. Again, why we don't want to move these buildings is because they speak so much to the era in which they were built, and we really should appreciate them that way, because don't you want to shop in a building that looks good? I have a whole series of here, which you shop here, and the place is all muddled and looks terrible, or do you want to go into a nicely rehab and store uh, building? Um, and then, Oopsie. There we go. And then there were small alterations that came along in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the the uh, uh, structure of glass, even that air style. You know, at one point we would have said, that's awful. We don't need a, a sign that big in our little 25 mile an hour or so. But now that sign's been up there for so long, it is also historic. <laughs> the community doesn't want to lose that. It's hard to, it's hard to get that glass. Uh, anyway, uh, so we want to make sure we're protecting that with uh, with our buildings. And I showed you a bunch of photos earlier about um, the sort of what has happened to many of our buildings over the evolution is that you know we went through an energy crisis and a lot of people, property owners you know boarded up their windows to save money and covered up tracks and windows. And this is this is this one is from Green Bay. Uh, that, my gosh, don't you want to just go into this building, but you might have questioned uh, going into the other property. And about that education, uh, it's just, you know, making property owners aware of what is damaging their buildings. Water is the biggest uh, detriment to a historic building. If it's not draining properly, if the roof is leaking, um, if you're sandblasting buildings, that is not a good thing. It removes that outer hard surface of the brick, and then it just starts to deteriorate, and there's nothing to, to stop it. So we want to just teach uh, best practices in taking care of our historic uh, buildings. There we go. And we also uh, try to work with communities on infill. Now, does this look like a good infill project for downtown? This is Concord, New Hampshire, and I always show it, and I'm like, oh, it allow that building to be built there. And when there was a fire that took down this building, but that building next to it, both the second and third floor, are not reachable, because the stairwell between the two buildings burned as well. And so those two floors are completely empty from um, CBS has that. And so we want to make sure that we talk about appropriate infill construction on Main Street. We're not anti construction, but we want it to be appropriate for our district. So there's a couple examples. Another one from Concord there. The building's a little tall, but it's still a good and another one from uh, Newmarket that you can still tell it's new, but there's keeping the same proportions, the same color, the same window opening. So we want to teach people about that. And then we want to make sure, and several people have talked about this, is the safety and the pedestrian environment um, in our downtowns, just to make sure that, that we are making sure that we're not automobile-oriented downtowns, that it really is about the pedestrian. Uh, those two photos on the left of Concord, that's a project that just got done, I want to say three years ago. Their main street was four lanes wide with diagonal parking on both sides, and they went on a street diet, and Main Street is not only two lanes wide. And did the retailers scream about that and fear that? Yes. But now they're praising it because it's like the best project that ever happened because now pedestrians don't have to go across four lanes and two lanes of parking, and all the semis quit driving down it because it's a much slower pace. Mm -hmm. And they did allow that little, like it's about six feet wide. That's where the UPS trucks park in the middle. Uh, so they don't have any problem uh, getting their kind of deliveries. But just enhancing the areas with umbrellas and things that make people feel uh, welcome in a community. 
And then one of my other pet peeves is national chains. Uh, again, we're not anti-national chains in our downtown, but when NAFTA comes in and paints a nice historic building blue with this yellow stripe around it, that kind of hurts preservation. And, uh, but there's one that's up in lines with Mark, it's their old city jail, NAFTA went into there. And Dollar General will do a different design. You just have to ask for it. And so that's where we work with our city and our partners on making sure that uh, the custom design guidance in our communities, because otherwise it happens to you and then you can't change it. So I'm going to turn it over to Delilah. Thank you, Jeff. I just have a short list of examples from Mitterford of design committee projects. We have the Dr. Park program. We've been doing that for over a decade um, just because there were, wasn't enough um, resource in our parks and rec departments to keep uh, the parks that we have around the downtown uh, accessible to people. And um, different groups are signed up to take care of parks for a season and they sign a contract. They don't do, you know, things with heavy machinery or anything like that, but they will let the parks department know where things need repairs. And um, just a great opportunity to call university students or a business that might want to impact them or you know. We have had different uh, speakers come in and talk to business owners. Uh, one of the storefronts that Sal uh, also came in and did a presentation about how to, you know, create storefront design. And then she worked one on one with quite a few business owners. And I heard from the business owners that that is the most significant thing they've learned since they opened their business or has had an impact. So, um, you know, often we've done that a few different times to offer people the chance to get one on one training going into their spaces. Uh, being the voice in town on historic preservation, that's one of the folks on the design committee. Um, our chair is an architect, and we have others who um, work in preservation, and um, that influenced our decision to do, apply for that um, partner in preservation grant. But even just doing that project and uh, communicating about historic preservation, um, a lot of people never think about historic preservation, or they think it's like people who love bricks <laughs> just in their own state. Um, but just being able to describe about what place means to um, community building and that um, sort of preservation is about preserving that place. Uh, so the whiskey barrels on the left were the program that Hard Bidford started in, at the beginning and every year we wheel them out and fill them with plants and walk around ourselves and water them. And um, then we, we got a plant to get a little bit nicer quality and got 20 of uh, nice planters out there. And um, that spurred the idea for the city to uh, purchase 100 planters to put those from the downtown and start to do hanging planters and paying full-time people who go every single day in the warm weather to water. So a lot of times what um, I mean you can do is pilot programs and ideas that would be good. And apparently we are you know we're good but um not enough and so it was great that the city took to on. <laughs> Um, we look at holiday lighting, and this group of people uh, loves to beautify the downtown and make it more um, welcoming and also uh, encourage holiday sales. So um, that group got a little tired of doing so much wrapping the trees themselves, but they were doing it. But now we'll have um, the, the University of Wisconsin give back and get lit. Um, <laughs> And so we see a best of time to get all the trees set up and then um, high school students, you know, class would come downtown for an afternoon and work with me and then I go buy them cocoa. <laughs> <laughs> Public art, um, we're not necessarily the main point on this, but this is a thought improvement grant program that we had and we were able to um, encourage building owners to have a bureau there um, and win other and if they're interested in um, getting a mural downtown, they'll often start to try to whatever they want to next. And we wish to call the city's um, public art information too. 
And we've had some movement programs using the times with funding coming either from a grant or, or through the city um, to funding and uh, being an organization that has relationships with property owners downtown and regularly being in communication, just letting them know about those grant programs. Um, sometimes we've been facilitators of them and other times the city had them or just um, conveyors of the message. Um, about both local programs as well as um, the tax credit programs that Kathy was mentioning. Um, I think that's kind of the range that we've been, but you know, uh, design committee programs can uh, build on the expertise that you have in your area. We have been involved in doing the progress or community feedback. Um, or at least getting people there, um, certainly showing up at different tables. We keep a spreadsheet of amenities needed in the downtown and just regularly meet with the codes department. Um, we uh, are advocates for getting better policy related to um, life in the downtown. Um, and the city doesn't want to be the bad guy, so a lot of times it's up to us to get property owners together to realize how their um, property will be of greater value if the products around them are in better condition so that they don't fight the city's efforts to put um, ordinances in place. I think I've been my example. Do you track the leverage ratio of your time <laughs> Uh, have we tracked the leverage ratio of our supply grants? Um, no, but it's easily three to one. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then I had a five minute break, so should I just keep going? This I don't want to be behind. Literally five minutes. You have five minutes to just stand up, stretch your leg, and then we're going to do the point. Okay, back then. You don't want to be on video. I think it's in the plan, right? To show the digital, right?
Good. We're going to be on video. Let this just let this one run. Yeah, five minutes, right? I get totality. Yeah. <laughs> 
So they came into our program and recognized that was their negative image and they needed to do something about it. And so they hired a firm out of Boston and they came up with their logo and their tagline and it said Claremont, New Hampshire, the new New England. <laughs> okay, well, what does that mean? It, it was a positive statement. They did bumper stickers that they handed out in the community and said, Claremont, question mark, question mark. Yes, Claremont, exclamation point, exclamation. <laughs> and then the board of directors had, did a little song and dance on their opera house stage and that played on cable access and, and pretty soon Claremont was taken back to the pride of their community. And in their first year, year and a half in our program, they had a net gain of 18 new businesses downtown because they focused on, we have a negative perception, let's change it. But if you have a positive perception about your community, you want to build on that. Um, and so there's a broad, you know, strokes with uh, promotion in doing special events. And I'll get on to my next slide here, I guess. But we're really just trying to bring people back to our community, people that live in our community, people who have never been in our community, and really feature the fun things that can go on. And I do pick out car shows a lot um, <laughs> because everybody has a car show. With and they're not different from the car show or the next one. The next one, but they don't bring a lot of people for some reason. But doing things like dragon boat races, like we're in Nevada a lot. They have camel races in Virginia City, which I don't know where the camels came from. <laughs> I think the hands in Virginia City, but they have camel races. They have coffin races in Gardnerville. <laughs> and they grow hearts of gold camel in the cabin. They, you know, they celebrate those things that make, uh, make them unique. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're just fostering this positive image about downtown. And by marketing that, you know, it's not just to shoppers, but it is to people who will invest, people who will open corporate businesses there. Uh, I've always talked about these billboards that are at Logan Airport. All the Boston Main Street districts are featured on, on billboards uh, through the tunnels and walkways at the airport. Uh, but it really just inspires and gives confidence to people about coming uh, to our Main Street districts. Um, so there are three components that we work on under promotion. Image campaigns, that, that, what are we doing 365 days a year to promote our downtowns? Sometimes we focus a whole lot of time and energy on that car show, and then it's one day and it's over. And we spend less time figuring out how to get people to come to our district, even when we're not having sidewalk sales or wine walks, but that they're coming because we are a destination that they want to come to. <laughs> the second category are business promotions. Gary talked about closing down the streets and making business owners mad about that. Is that if we're also on setting in those street closures with events that are specifically to get people through the doors of the businesses and spending money? You know, like this, they want like sidewalk sales, like Ladies Night Out, like Small Business Saturday. It's not about having a band out on the street that will distract people from shopping or a concert in the park. It really is about getting people into the businesses. And it's not Main Street's job to force people to spend money in your district, but it is Main Street's job to bring people to the district. It's up to the business owners to be open. That's the number one one. Sure. Uh, to have the right product, to treat people right, and to you know just take care of their customers. And then the third category is the one that many communities do really well, which is put on special events and festivals, having your community parades, um, whatever your uh, Heart of Gold Camel Festival is, or your camel races. Those are things that are really interesting to people. They want to come to something that's different and, and new. Um, and, and again, that's a great way to encourage and engage new volunteers uh, in your program. In Chippewa Falls, we had pure water days because Chippewa Falls does have the purest water in the world. <laughs> okay, you all bought it. <laughs>
And then when day three started, we started a rubber dummy base as, as part of that. So I had 20 volunteers that just had bottom worker t-shirts <laughs> that their job was to stand by the rocks and swoosh out any ducks that got hung up. <laughs> <laughs> Until the year we had seven inches of rain, uh, two days before, and our battling broke turned into the raging Colorado River. <laughs> then I had to put all the volunteers further back. <laughs> But those are the, the three kinds. And, and again, it's about recognizing your assets, right? And build on that. And is it the business community? Is it your history? Is it your culture? Is it your buildings? Is it the gathering spaces? What, what are those assets that you can build these promotional activities off of? Uh, that photo at the top is Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, their Main Street Executive Director, who's been there like almost 20 years, loves Disney. In your town. <laughs> and so they light up their downtown every year. Um, it's kicking off, I think, this week. Um, and they have a big bright light ball every summer to help pay for this. And the biggest prize you can get on is the right to throw the switch, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a pretty good honor. But they draw 1.2 million visitors to downtown Rochester. And the first year they did it, uh, retailers on average reported a 30% sales increase. So it's not just pretty, it actually brought economic benefit uh, to their downtown. So what are those uh, advantages that you have? And I'm gonna turn it over to Ed to talk about what's going on at Greater World Talk. Okay. All right, motion. Yeah, you know, I'm working on myself. Um, so uh, when I started, um, even though the Greater Grove Hall Matrix had been around for 20 years, and actually people didn't know what it was, they uh, confused it with Grove Hall NBC, Grove Hall Trust, all these that was defunct. So um, I actually had something to build on. Um, so I had interviews with all the all the owners, TV stations, radio stations, newspapers, etc. Uh, I said, "Go read all the things for college papers, college radio stations, podcasts, whatever." Um, and so this was the foundation of my um, media relations. Meaning that if I needed to do a story the next week, for instance, I now know the editors or the hosts of all the shows, so it's easy for me to be able to promote the kinds of events that they promote. In the um, in the area, and also gave me lots of uh, practice to understand how they can make the cost, what they look like, so I can keep getting better at, at what I was doing. Um, some of the things I know you guys are this is like practitioners, but these are like the I claim the tips. And so a lot of times people will spend a lot of time trying to write the news release, and I've almost given up. I always just make a story myself because um, a lot of small papers or small outlets they don't have the resources. So if you send in a story that's pretty close, they just have to do a little digging. They just run the story as it is. Um, so I do that quite frequently. Um, so here's an example where I wrote a story for myself, right? <laughs> I think it's an award. I'm from a small town. I wrote the story, I sent it in, and they, they published it. In this particular situation, uh, one of my main street businesses had a ribbon cutting. Uh, that was the store owner, the mayor showed up, etc. There's me holding the ribbon, and um, if there's no press there, there's nobody there. So I called the mayor's office the next day. I said, Can I get one of the photo? I think they gave me the link to the photo, which I got. I wrote it up, sent it to the paper, and there was the article that they stayed down. Um, this brought into the media, so it's not unusual for somebody in the community that reporters are one of the colleagues to ask me what's the most story that you're doing. But it's also not uncommon for them to talk about a story they know nothing about. So, for example, um, one time they were calling me to ask me what my opinion was on a ride sharing program or on a trauma program, something else. So, what I do, which I think is also the best practice, is they ask the reporter, what is the story you work with now, and what questions do they have to be specifically, and when their, what's their deadline? So that gives me the rest of the day to work on an answer, and then I can I can put out a written statement. I put always the written statements. Now I don't want to take out of context. I have the statement in writing, and therefore um, it allows me to be able to continually be uh, impressed. But the reason is because the reporters always know. 
that I'm almost like a first stop when they're doing a story. It's reason because I'm doing the research, so I'm almost like doing research with them. And when I get something back, there's nothing to use. Recently, it was so bad that there was actually something that happened in a neighboring Main Street district. And a reporter called me and I said, Why are you so this in my district? Well, that woman hates the press. So she comes <laughs> on. Um, also, for example, one time, uh, again, this is the time I do this work. I had a reporter call, City Council was having a resolution on uh, reparations, and they said, um, Do you think businesses should receive reparations? And I was like, I have never even heard of that question before. <laughs> So I'm doing all my research, doing my research, et cetera, et cetera. I get back to the reporter. They don't story. So I just write it myself. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, um, creating a pitch, the backgrounder, all this kind of stuff. You're a regular PR person. Uh, we do a newsletter each month. So when I started out in the beginning, we had no subscribers. We had no newsletter. Now we have about 2,000, uh, which is good. Now we have 200 businesses in my industry. Um, all the speaking and writing, all those things. And so what I said here is always have a story or something you want to talk about. People are going to get invited or asked to speak because it takes the time to get the presentation together. That would be easier. Um, there's always opportunities to write and publish. A lot of times, for example, like I said the other day, I might have um, somebody who sends an email that says five reasons why we should do something or should do something. Oh, they thought that's a story. Yeah. I'll just take that and I'll write it up and I'll publish it. So, um, so here's the case study and one little example. We did a program called um, Black Women Lead. And what we did is we identified uh, 200 Black women leaders from the 1700s to the present who had an impact on Boston. So the, the sort of like a little bit of the background behind the story is again, uh, we have been doing public art and the public art had come to the fact that I went to an event that said that there was a correlation between the public art and economic development. So when I went and looked at the city's website, I saw all these red dots focused on downtown Boston, which is where all the public art was. And then my neighborhood had one red dot, which was a painted utility box. <laughs> so I said, oh my God, I live in a public art desert. <laughs> So I was trying to we started doing other things, some of the murals, you know, they saw the murals, so we the murals, we made those posters, we put it in the airport, because we saw the cat we talked about. Um, we took the we took the spaces and the bus shelters and then they had ads, and then we used those to exhibit photography. So we had uh, 12 photographers basically put up poster side prints of their photography. So now it's almost uh, you get to go to a an art exhibit for the bus. Um, so we did more things like that, and then this last one was just at a giant scale because we took the portraits of the 200 women, we had them uh, commission artists to do all of those portraits, we put them on bands and they hang from light poles. Mm -hmm. So if you're driving down Liverpool Avenue, which is the, the center of my district, you drive for two miles and all you see are pictures of black women hanging from the lights. So it's quite an experience. And so when I was writing about it for one story, one, one outlet, I said Andy Warhol, um, Hip Hop, and Kristoff. <laughs> and it, it, it so I don't know if those people are so that the um, the concept of hip hop is when you have found space on sidewalks or walls or something like that. So we were using your parents saying that we found some free space and then the end of Warhol was all the pictures of these modern versions of these women. And then Kristoff was the takeoff of when he did the gates in Central Park. And so again, we said anyway, so that was a part of the story. Um so here's what happened. So here's, I'm just showing you how I did this. So again, instead of the military things, I wrote my own story, which the man or man. Um, here's another one. This is Boston Herald. Now, see, no, it's, it's an opinion piece. So I wrote an op-ed on my project. So here's the here's the women hanging from the lighthouse. Um, here, here's a, one of the TV shows. So this is like real TV, so this is Channel 5. So I'm featured on the TV show. There, there I am on my glory. <laughs> Here's uh, an internet show. So this is just, literally just an internet radio station. There I am there. John was Jimmy. Um, now, well, I, let's try this. 
Let's try it. We're going to try to see if we can play one of these. Yeah. Oh, she's all excited. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I don't know. We, we, we see it, we can hear it. We know it's there. I don't. Back. Above my pay grade. I see. Can you see yep. One minute. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. What a special place. Now, this may not be household names yet, but a dozen of these, my fellow, showed up to break a box and began to engage in community leaders. Thanks, Jordan, how to have a look to his Situation matters. It's a common motto often heard, not always seen, on the Lamilla Avenue, the Sierra Avenue, near Toronto. You look up and it's all these white words, like a constant reminder of what Cassie calls it, his curriculum. He wanted to plug for his heart, they collect these on the story of Black Eagle Music's boss. They were trying to say it's different than uh, focusing on the most powerful, most influential, the most profound. Sure, it's not a famous object, smoke, and power. And next to that, you see Shawnee and Shawnee and Hansalot. Um, he is one of two of the characters that are selected. Yes, he is the executive director of the Greater World Paul Main Streets. At first, they were only going to have six portraits. People love them. And they got some great response that uh, I said, oh, geez. We mentioned this brand new farm that six purple and hundred and ultimately those two hundred twelve originally fundraised yeah. organizations struggled to understand the art installation. The big craft foundation came aboard to fill the gap. That should have been a surprise because the crowd is very rich. We used to think that they were Hall of Fame players, and this is the Hall of Fame of a lot of these black women leaders. How far is this going on for it, and how many portraits are out there? So it extends for two miles from uh, basically Cedar Street and uh, Blue Hill, all the way down to West Cottage Street and Blue Hill. It took two artists months to produce all of the portraits. Can they have portraits of everybody? So in some cases, we get all the black and white to do it as sketching. There are mother and daughters, civil rights leaders. There are all the coaches. Part black woman, police officer, first black woman, fire woman. People, a young black girl to look up to quite literally. And the idea was that the career path is been. There's already been a black woman from the area that's already gone on and succeeded at the gunman. In Locks area, only so WBC News. Well, that, that's why it took me a while. So here's the, here's the, here's the thing, though. I uh, I wanted to bring some attention to the rap because because you talk about bringing people to the district, but well, people are driving in to see what they know and don't have the bags, and I'm afraid they're going to run into something and they might not fall. But it's been great in a number of ways because again, we were always trying to figure out how do we make this neighborhood. I told you some like all the economic challenges, but our business makes is like um, barbershops, beauty salons, nail salons, work, um, bodegas, convenience stores, liquor stores, work of storefront churches. So there's not like the natural attraction that would bring people here, but now people are really like it. And uh, so we've heard from like students, like little girls who say we just like to walk past. All these women every day. We have residents who would just like to look out the neighborhood and see black women featured, um, commuters. 
uh, the business people. And so all in all, this is obviously this is our largest public art project, and it's been classified as that. It's actually gone on to be featured in uh, Black Enterprise magazine, etc. The story that I showed you on Channel 4, but it's on Channel 4, Channel 5, Channel 7, Channel 25, and then you know, featured in uh, so. Again, I write the story for the Boston Herald. It doesn't count because they've been writing their own stories. That means there's two stories in the Herald, there's stories in the Globe, there's stories in the Banner. And so I wanted to show you the pages and pages of all the, the coverage that we've gotten. And so we've been earlier when I was checking about the different kinds of outlets. Here's me speaking at a campus radio station. And um, this actually photo is taken from somebody who was doing uh, Facebook Lives. They were just with, with their cell phone. And um, here's me on uh, community access and featuring one of the artists. So again, the same story. Uh, there's stories now about the artist. So I sent the same kind of write-up to his. Um, first of all, every woman we sent, uh, we sent the write-up to their town, so they wrote stories about it. And he's an artist, so I put it to his town, so they put a story on it, because most of the women were between 60 and 90. I didn't work with, with age Boston, and so their seniors are doing a story on it. I also, there's a black travel and tourism, but we took the story to them, and they're doing a story on it. So it was the same story, the same amount of work, leveraging a number of different ways to promote the project. So again, I played a case study, Here's an example of doing it and promoting our district and project, et cetera, et cetera. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I did go and have a couple of examples. There's some more. <laughs> <laughs> when you're running from Mayor of Boston. <laughs> That's a, that's a good point. <laughs> um, the last of the four points is economic vitality. This is by far the one that most communities struggle with the most because they like throwing events and festivals. They like planting flowers, doing manners. Um, they like doing, you know, fundraising events, et cetera. But economic vitality is the one that, if we'd have had that expertise back in the day when everybody started leaving, we might have not been in as bad shape as downtown Scott in the 70s and 80s. Um, so it's the harder one uh, to work on. Um, and, and it really is about strengthening uh, your existing businesses, right? So it's so much cheaper to uh, keep existing businesses than to recruit uh, new ones to the district. And it's really uh, also looking at business expansion. Um, I was in a community in Brush, Colorado, and we did their transformation strategies, which was built on their agricultural and ranching heritage there. And after doing surveys and looking at market data and hearing what people wanted, you know, some of the things that they wanted were like you keep and clothing. Well, we're probably not going to get a menswear shop to open up that specializes in that, but the hardware store or the seed store could start carrying that kind of line and it'll help them expand. In my community, uh, we had a, a couple ladies came to me and said they wanted to open a candy store. And I looked at our market dad and I said, I don't think he'll survive here. And then she went and paddled on me to the mayor. <laughs> the mayor said, are you discouraging businesses from opening? And I said, well, no, I just can't. The numbers aren't here to support this. And so, you know, we went to our Walmart store and said, why don't you put in four feet of fine chocolates and a rack of gummy groups, you know, and we'll be able to send people there for candy. Um, the candy store ladies did try uh, to open a store. They were mad at me, so they didn't open it in downtown and they were close six months later. <laughs> um, so, in that, my intuition was right that I went to the candy store. But, um, it's also looking at the spaces that we have in our districts. What are underutilized? Um, a lot more cities now are, oh, I'm sure it's just in, in one community in Florida where they had four fairly large properties in their downtown that were just storage units for somebody. They were storing all their crap in these storefronts. And so more communities are initiating vacancy ordinances and things like that, that if you're in a commercial district, your commercial space must be activated. 
or you're going to be paying higher taxes and fees and penalties and such. So we're, we're trying to make the most of our property. That's why we needed to get the slip covers off the building so we could activate second and uh, third stories. Having housing in our downtown is extremely important because people who live in downtown spend a lot more of their disposable income in the downtown. So we need to get those spaces uh, developed. So economic vitality just means thinking about things in, in a different way than it's traditionally seen. What, what is out there that we can uh, bring into our districts that will either bring more jobs, bring more people, bring more shoppers. And, and it's really about making things happen instead of waiting uh, for things to happen. Like that town and I, when I told you that built their own hotel by having people in the community invest in a hotel property. Um, one of our very early Great American History Award winners was Bonaparte, Iowa. I think they're like 500 people. And they didn't have a grocery store. And they, again, chipped in together, sold chairs, and opened the township grocery store. And so what are those things that, you know, we maybe thought we couldn't do uh, before, but we really could uh, if we find the means to do that. Um, and again, there we go. Uh, again, the economic vitality is really strengthening our local economies and, and, and developing new entrepreneurs for the downtown as well. So supporting our existing base in the space and then that assemblage of resources. Delilah you know, mentioned having a, a contest for uh, people to come in and incentivize. And we did, I had a lot of agencies in my downtown when we started as well. And one of my bankers said, Kathy, everybody coming to me with a business idea is about $30,000 short of what they really need to get off to a healthy start. I had five banks in downtown. And he said, I'm going to ask every bank to kick in $5,000 and let's do a business plan contest and we'll offer a $25,000 prize. I'm all for it. Nothing out of my budget. And they're putting in all the money. They were the judges. We gave them assistance in how to write a business plan. Um, and uh, I think the first year we had four applicants. We chose one winner. The other three had done their homework. They also opened. The second year we ran it. Uh, we actually got a bookstore that had been in a strip mall in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And she, she came to my uh, Christmas parade and said more people would walk past my store this one night than have walked past my store in three years. Uh, in the southern location. And then we had the four vacancy issue. Now we were the place to be. Now we had a lot of retail. And so we had short term investment by those bankers that reaped great rewards for our community. So, what are the things that you can do to assemble some resources uh, in your community? And sometimes your cities have uh, incentive programs, sometimes counties uh, have those as well. Um, and, and then you know, we, we, did, we have done uh, small business surveys since COVID hit. We actually have a, a small business survey going on uh, right now, but we did a, a survey of 500 businesses. Uh, oh, actually, this one is from Cushman Wakefield, not our, our survey. But in, in the survey of corporations, uh, they said that uh, talent attraction and retention is the most common reason businesses choose to locate uh, in your community. Architecture plays a role, uh, a role. They mentioned things that offer cool housing spaces as well, and looking for that live work play space. So who's ever slogan is live work play. Uh, yeah, that's what you gotta go. Right? <laughs> um, and then we have to be involved in that downtown planning, right? So a lot of communities will do these kinds of maps to say, what's our downtown made out of? So you can color token, what's retail, what's professional, what's government services, where are parking lots, uh, where are opportunities for redevelopment, but just having an understanding of the opportunities of things that, that could come into play, even changing land use changes. Uh, Littleton, New Hampshire is one of the most contiguous historic buildings in their district, except that's one spot where there's a Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> that is, it sits way back. And I said, how they, how, how were they allowed to build that down here? And they said, well, city code says, new construction, you have to be 50 feet back from the street. I said, in downtown, well, it's the same for everywhere in town. And I was like, well, you need to change that. Uh, because it's not that, you know, 
and better development that we have in there than than Dunkin' and Donuts that we have a lot of Dunkin' Donuts in New England, right? Uh, we also uh, in a lot of research is that sometimes people think we have to go outside our community to find businesses to come in, but seventy percent of all businesses that have been started have been come from people in the community. And when it comes to businesses in our older commercial districts, about 74% of those businesses are started by somebody already in your community. So are you aware of who has home-based businesses or people come to your farmer's market and they're selling something? Are any of those people able to be included in our communication so that they can come to workshops and things? Or do we have space to invite incubator businesses to come in? Uh, really just taking a look at that and then when I, you know, so I started my job in, I told you, 1989. You know, I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have a computer. My newsletters, my first three newsletters, I did on a typewriter. <laughs> and I had an underbody. I found some bold features. <laughs> and I used the clip art. You know, cut that out, stuck it on my newsletter, and took it to the printer. So, you know, I... I couldn't reach people really easily. And when we were doing our business recruitment, we said, well, we want to find somebody who's going to open a second location. And they have to be located within 50 miles of the city. Do you know how we were able to find those businesses? Yeah. We went to the library. We had all the area phone books. <laughs> and we went through the elevators, finding businesses that were out there located. And we sent them a postcard. And we said, we wish you were here. <laughs> You know, home to lighting, Google beer, Mason shoe, factory outlet. And if you'd like our full business recruitment folder, give us a call. I think we mailed out 150 and got two uh, responses. <laughs> it's so much easier. If I had social media back then, <laughs> Dan, oh man, the things I've been done. <laughs> Um, and then again, you know, just to, we do a lot. We, we recently got a big grant from the Kauffman Foundation and have been doing entrepreneurial ecosystem work, actually equitable entrepreneurial ecosystem work in 10 states. Um, some communities are being chosen to get grants uh, to also help foster that. What, what are we making for the being alone? <laughs> Maybe. But first, we have to have to pull it again. <laughs> But we do have a lot of materials on our website uh, as well as far as entrepreneurial ecosystems. And that's just looking at what you have in place. What are the incentives in your community? They don't all have to come from the Main Street program. And where are the spaces? And what are the amenities? What are the things that would encourage or cause people uh, to come to your district? I've been in, in many communities and, and I'll say, well, give me the top five reasons why I should go create a business here. Yeah, that's what I usually get inspired. And I'm like, well, you know, somebody thinks of one. We need you. I'm like, oh, that, that you should leave with that. You should maybe tell me space is affordable. That's a better way of saying we need you. Uh, but talk about your schools, talk about community pride, even if it, you know, or you can say we have another. Great boutiques here. We want you to be part of that, but really have an understanding of why uh, businesses might come there. And a big thing that we have seen happen in our downtown, and sometimes this is is changing uses in downtown, is small scale manufacturing uh, coming in. Uh, Melanzana is in Leadville, Colorado. They make these hats, jackets, mittens, all sorts of stuff. They sell mostly online. And you go in there, and the first 20 feet is selling uh, that stuff. But on the back side are 45 sewing machines and 40 people working back there. So we're intensifying the uses of these larger buildings in our district. And Range is a leather goods place in Laramie, uh, Wyoming. Most of the manufacturing is on the second story, and then downstairs is their showroom uh, where they sell uh, really cool uh, leather uh, stuff. And this was a really cool uh, business I, I found in Iowa. Uh, it was a quilting store. She had her second story that she made into a quilting retreat. And so you and your friends can go there and make quilts and stay in the beds. They're all lined up like that. There's like 20 beds um, there. One end of the room is kind of a, a bathroom and a shower and a kitchen. So you can either fix your meals there or go out and eat in the restaurants. 
they all they kind of develop for weddings, funerals, things like that as well. But what an interesting use uh, for property in downtown. Same thing with Airbnb rentals that happen in our, our districts as well. But there are thousands of really cool ideas that communities are implementing uh, in their communities. Um, this is the whole process that we take communities through. Again, we don't want any random and just choose projects. We want it to be based on what your vision is for your community. So if you had an arts and culture uh, strategy for your downtown, then you should be doing a car show. <laughs> you know, you should be doing art events, you should be doing the murals, you should be doing fundraisers that are art related. Um, and you should be recruiting galleries, recording studios, dance studios. So you're really focusing on if this is our, our vision for our district, what is that going to mean across the four points, and especially for the economic vitality piece? And this is a visit we do uh, to a lot of communities. We come in, we, we bring in your ESRI data, which is your market data that says, what are you best at selling? The who? And how much retail dollars are you leaking out of your community? Or what, what is the surplus for you? So we look at your strengths, we survey the community to find out what they want and how they're using the district. Um, and then we define what your transformation strategy would be. Brush, Colorado, when I was there, and I told them, well, your strategy is agriculture. And they said, we don't want to be known as a cowboy farm town. Until I reminded them that their main restaurant was called True Brits. <laughs> uh, their barber had a little horsey chair for kids to sit in. Uh, they had a door called Downtown Doug, a country store. Uh, their Main Street logo had hoops for um, <laughs> And their high school math got team are called the Beet Diggers because they grow so many sugar beets there. I had five of them with fresh beets with a pretty cool t shirt. <laughs> um, and then they said, Well, when you put it that way, you guys said, Well, don't you understand that the businesses are supported by how well these farmers and ranchers do around you? And they went, so it's, it's sort of bringing all the pieces together. That's one of the visits that we do. We encourage that these four points do not work in silos, but they work together. And so that at the end of the year, we can say, what progress did we make in, uh, in our agricultural strategy? They didn't have a farmer's market. And they started one. I went back and said, how did you do this? And it was great. I said, tell me about it. They said, we started with six centers, we ended with 18. I said, that's great, what else? <laughs> I said, did your businesses say they saw more people on the days you held the farmer's market? Oh, we didn't ask. <laughs> I said, how much business did they do? Oh, we didn't ask. You know, if you could track, you know, even if it's anonymously, before you leave the market today, tell us how much money you made. So by the end of the season, we could say a half a million dollars was taken in by our farmer market vendors. That's a half a million dollars now circulating in our local economy. So we have to have those points of success and measurement uh, on those things. So that's that third piece to understanding where we want our district to be and make sure everybody's working in that same way. And that's what it looks like. We have our inputs, we choose our strategy, and then and some communities have a couple strategies that they might work on, and then we just make sure it goes across uh, the four points of Main Street. And this is some of the data that we bring in. We look at trade areas for communities. We look at uh, psychographic or tapestry information because we, you know, you can tell sort of what people's habits are. Um, and again, then we look at sales gap and we pitch in the different categories. So that's a really heavy kind of piece. But I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. <laughs> That was great, Kathy. I don't know how uh, much I might have to add to that. I guess it was interesting to hear you say that economic vitality is one of the challenges that some of the main street programs have. And the way that we look at it, you know, you could, let's say, have a really strong organization and do a lot of great promotional events, and your buildings look really nice, but if there's nothing in there, it's not going to do anybody any good, really. So economic vitality, to us, is all about 
Um, the ways that you can cultivate that ecosystem to ensure that all of your assets and opportunities are being utilized and barriers are being removed so that that economic activity, those buildings can be used and in all stories of those buildings be used in a positive way that the businesses are able to function and function successfully. And um, the, the third piece of that, which is probably the most important, is it's all about relationships and that these Main Street programs really are the linchpin to all of the different relationships that have to happen in order to make sure that the buildings are being used and the stores that are in there with the appropriate businesses and that the, the actual size of the stores are appropriate for the businesses that are in your area and having those relationships with lenders, having those relationships with entrepreneurs support organizations. And I can say that what we see across Connecticut is that um, I can think of one community, there are a few communities where they're really struggling with resale. And they're really struggling with vacancy. And they're the ones that usually don't have a, an active Main Street program that is up and running. Whereas the communities that have a Main Street program that is up and running, boots on the ground, are the ones that are having those relationships with those property owners, that are working and finding the right small businesses, but are also still talking to those businesses once they are there and making sure that they're doing okay. Um, so when we go into uh, our communities for doing assessment tools, I'm just going to walk you through some of the questions that we're asking our Main Street partners to think through in terms of their economic vitality um, initiatives, because these are the things that they need to know. So, for example, do you know what all of your assets are? Are you aware that all your buildings, the shape that they're in, the kinds of um, businesses that uh, they can house, or if they can be residential? You know who is owning them, so that you're always thinking about how those things can be used. And I do want to say, this is, um, you know, when it's late in the day, your thoughts don't go in any particular order. So I, just, I wish you all would be following anything that I'm saying. Um, but data, 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 data. And I know that Kathy was alluding to it. In any way that you can collect data is really important. This is one of them. Like you want to have a handle on your inventory. You want to have a handle on how it's being used. And then you want to be able to report out those things that you can say, you know, I have 100 buildings and 99.9% of them are being used um, and used in a good way that's benefiting our community. Um, uh, is there a sort of preservation of those? Because those are economic um, drivers for your community. Like, one, is, as you were saying, it can be cheaper to use an existing structure. Um, two, it's usually great looking and it drives people to want to be in that space, uh, either as a, as a business owner or as a, as a visitor. And, you know, there are funds that are available. If you are interested in um, picking a historic building to develop in your main street, then you're going to have support for that. How does your zone zoning zoning? <laughs> Do I need to say anything? <laughs> but that's like that, you know, these are the things that the main street program is there to start like going to those TPC meetings and going to those town halls and advocating for zoning and supportive of all kinds of things, not just housing, but housing downtown is the life preserver of our downtown. We have neighborhoods that honestly you would never think we're gonna be okay in the pandemic and they thrive. Rise because they are they have housing everywhere and and those residents patronize those businesses in the most challenging times that we had to navigate. They actually did great during COVID, unlike other parts of town and or other cities that you would have thought would have been able to weather the storm better. And we know now, you know, obviously with work habits are you know all up in the air that having that housing there is going to be the thing that makes sure that your main street thrives but also make sure that the first streetscape connects to economic vitality I have no slide for this but if for example in a in city that I, I won't name but it happens to also be the capital they <laughs> Some of the building Yukon, okay, the people coming into the so they never have to go down on the street. Sure. 
No, <laughs> why? They did it. Anyway, I'm just throwing that out there. I think it's really helping. Um, do you have a plan for your vacant storefronts and lots? Planning is so important. Curating your main street is so important. Um, don't have, we have towns and cities in Connecticut where they have amazing antique stores everywhere, but don't expect to eat when you go there because they don't have any restaurants. You have some places where you can go to any number of restaurants, but there's nothing to do. And unless all you do is eat, you know, for five hours straight <laughs> at different places, it's not a very good strategy. Oops, so darn. And that's kind of what I'm looking into the recruiting businesses and having a strategy. We have this one economic development director. He is so great. He has this little checklist. Of all the businesses that they well, we don't have a bakery yet, so we need bakery. And and being very conscientious too about where that business is placed and thinking through that this is a good spot for it because it's next to this business clusters. And in terms of business recruitment and also making our communities more inclusive, and I mentioned this in my remarks earlier, one of the ways that we're helping business. Sorry. <laughs> Um, is to go into our communities that they don't have a mainstream program that's up and running quite yet, and they are pulling their hair out between the challenges they're facing with their property owners that are just making it absolutely impossible for people to rent their spaces, um, and finding the right kind of entrepreneurs who are willing to do it. Uh, and the thought of those relationships, what we're doing is we're bringing a team together in that town that includes real estate brokers and includes this is an extremely important key part of entrepreneur support organization. I'm sure you have them in Rhode Island. We do, besides an SBDC, which is more national, we have a business development council, we have Black Business Alliance, we have another place called Reset, and they have a whole retail incubation program. These are young entrepreneurs that are eager to get into brick and mortar spaces, and, and they'll go to a community in Connecticut that's not very big. They may live in Hartford. They don't mind going down to Waterbury. This is being absolutely nothing to well, but you should get the drift that it's not the main place, and they're still willing to go. So it's making those connections, and again, it's all about making it easy for both the property owners and the businesses to be successful. So being that advocate that is going to um, talk about like having some kind of incentive programs, negotiating with landlords about being more open to giving people a year of free rent. There was an entire town in the United Kingdom that gave business owners free rent for a year because their stores were vacant. And now the town is thriving and those businesses are successful. But at the same time, like it's also being protected. There was another instance of a business that opened up um, near a main street in a location that nobody wanted. And this a guy up in a sandwich shop, he was hugely successful. People left lines out the door. So what did the landlord do? They raised the rent, and he had a close-up shop. Mm -hmm. So as a main street program, it's being protective of situations like that. And making sure, like maybe it's starting a program, something else we're exploring where you can encourage your business owners to actually purchase buildings, wealth building, inclusive, and also those are the places that they're going to keep that building occupied and used because they have an investment in the community, they have an investment in that main street. Unlike some, I don't know if you have this problem in Rhode Island, but we have a problem in one of our towns where an entire block in a in a downtown that has like two blocks, maybe three, um, they had a, an inn that took a full block and it was purchased by an out of state person and they gutted the whole thing and then for whatever reason didn't continue and it has been vacant in their main street looking terrible. Now it's such a fire hazard that the fire department's not allowed to go into that building if it catches on fire. Um, so it's this, you know, how do we prevent situations like that? Connecticut, actually, and this is where coordinating programs are helpful. We um, advocated for a receivership act, which allowed people to take over properties like that. And um, because they're vacant for so long, they can actually pay to renovate. And then if the person who owns the building doesn't want to pay them back for the renovations, they get to claim it. And so 
the, this particular in is the first case that this is being brought into the courts because of the situation. So, you know, it's thinking about ordinances, positive incentive programs, but also putting in place commercial vacancy taxes, et cetera, to ensure that your main street is as vital as it can be, how you're going to make sure, again, that that is a fertile environment. Uh, property owner engagement is very important to just make sure that you have relationships with them and creating opportunities. Um, again, going back to how you make things easy for um, anyone that's either trying to make a building better or be a business, creating these one-stop shops to make it simple. Um, how do you support your small businesses? It's also bringing in those entrepreneur support programs so that they're there on site to make sure that they're successful. And the one thing that we, this is the summary, the one thing that um, I realized that we don't have in this presentation that I'm um, going to add is arts and culture are a business. So treat them like one. They're not there to be, you know, an event, whatever. They are a business in that when you're, and they help your businesses. And so you should talk to them and work with them on being sustainable so that they survive because when they're healthy and successful, the rest of the industry is as well. Thank you. And it's just a summary. You want to have a time? No, I didn't. Do you want to give me a time? We bring all of our panelists up so we can um, read some questions. All right. Either who has a question or who has a full technical that is unique to your community that you want us to know about. Uh, so, I know so we have some questions um, for the panelists. Hi, I think we hear a whole lot about um, driving in the track. So, 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 uh, our economy is something like that is so determined. One of the things we do both is the area of black and white forest is we create ways to not only attract more forests, but you have to follow in uh, bed and breakfast at work. But each overnight you have to generate the following needs and follow the local economy. So, what we do is we not only make it more of a warm invitation for people to come stay with us, stay in our accommodations. Then we give them incentives and education to drive out to Main Street and put on a lot of businesses. So, you know, places like that want to be attracted to Main Street. Uh, their business, you know, in Applebee's, you have a line outside the door and one of us said, we don't well, we try to push business that way. We try to push business to the local community and store that want business. So it's a real symbiotic relationship between our Sort of uh, bureau and people coming in. You know, most of the overnight visitors that we try to encourage, but locals and day trippers play a part in it too. So, is there as much going on out there to uh, drive and still attract? Yeah, I'm going to start with anybody else can answer. I would say yes. I would say CVPs and tourism and offices are great partners for Main Street programs for all the reasons that you said. And, you know, just doing that marketing and image building, you know, I was thinking, you know, that 365 day promotion instead of just working on Small Business Saturday and doing those events. And at most of these events like that RC and Moon Pie Festival at Bell Buffalo, Tennessee, uh, you know, 
they only have a population of like 430,000 people come. So that's filling heads and heads and it's, it's driving sales to the uh, community. So most of those fun events like that are always intended to bring people in from a much greater uh, trade area. Even Main Street programs that are running more than a one day event, when they're running a couple day event where they, they are, they definitely have to be staying overnight. But I think that's a key piece. I've been to two conferences. I was just out one in Oregon. I came in, I got a card. It had a wooden five dollar bill on it. And it said and the city actually funded it. So everybody who came to the conference was given five dollars to go spend in the community. And then they could measure the leverage ratio of that. The businesses, you know, I took mine in, I had five dollars, I think I ended up spending twenty-seven. You know, that's a pretty good return for that city to get that back. Um, you know, so every, you know, then I was just at the Illinois conference, I got an EIP button for the same thing. I could go into these businesses and I think I had a couple of dollars to spend, but mainly it was on discounts. So they could measure that because they knew we're all out of town. We're all from out of town. It was Pontiac, Illinois was hosting it, but 95% of the people at the conference came from someplace else. And it's a great audience, and that's why we, we follow our transformation strategies, because a lot of communities do have tourism as a transformation strategy. And so what do we build on? What are they looking for? They're looking for restaurants. And whenever I checked into a hotel, I didn't do it here because I got here too late last thing. Uh, but I usually say, can you recommend a local place to eat? And if they tell me Applebee's, I give them a little bit of education on that. <laughs> business. But, uh, you know, that's what I was looking for. What I always promote to people is, you know, I can eat at the Applebee's in Concord, New Hampshire. I don't need to come to Pawtuck to eat at the Applebee's here. But I can look at, and I'm sorry, I missed dinner. I know you had a good spot for dinner last night. But um, I always look for those unique places. Anybody want to add to that? I don't know. Um, there are a lot of really interesting strategies that I've been seeing among communities engage in. So, for example, um, creating uh, events that pull in businesses and get them working together for something. So, the Warner Theater in Torrington was um, doing a showing of the Great Escape. And they partnered with the neighboring Thomaston to activate the train and then pulled in local restaurants for this entire experience. People are looking for experiences. And so it's playing on that um, and getting the, the different businesses and organizations to work together to create these unique experiences that are for locals as much as for um, for residents. The second thing, I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about tours, but you know, there are people there that we want to engage and engage regularly. So one of the things that we're looking at and exploring with our partner um, towns and cities is, are you talking to the HR directors of your anchor employers? Um, was it Kathy when you had met, uh, something saying, something saying about um, how they wouldn't go to the business, Kathy, that they wouldn't show up at downtown um, as an employer. And then now that's the main selling point. Um, so start doing like employee days where you get them to go to that restaurant, you get them to, to do things in the downtown, uh, talk to that anchor, those anchor institutions about bringing their employees in to do things. Yeah. Okay. I'll add one more thing that's going to remind me. Some, of, some communities have uh, uh, colleges and universities as their transformation strategy. And a lot of times people think, oh, that's just the students going to the school. But there's a whole breakdown of subcategories, which are the parents who come to drop them off and come back to the parents' feet. And it's all the teams coming in from out of town to play against their football team and their sports teams. It's all the people that come to use that campus during the summertime when there's different programming going on. And so that all of those things we identify when we work with communities on their strategy is, um, again, Let's look at every possibility of how do we get more people here, spending more time and more money in our community. So I think it's a really important. Well, I would ask, uh, I think we have a six high per capita housing population in the 50 states. Yeah. Right. So how, how do you balance bringing in 
floors are creating all of this and the impact of the short term rental industry. Because that's what we run into in a lot of our destination spots here in Rhode Island, where it's great. We've got tourists, we want to have tourist money, but now all of our neighborhoods and all the workforce housing are being flipped into Airbnbs. How is that going to happen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, first off, as, as long as you know, right. a lot of cities have had trouble getting them all registered, and so then they're paying into the bed tax number one. So that, that's a big issue. Yeah, it's a tricky balance. I was in a small town in Tennessee that the, this woman had four apartments up, upstairs, and she turned three of them into Airbnb, and she said, Well, I'm I can get three times the amount of money out of them than if I rented it as an apartment, so I can't fault it for that. And she's making more money, so hopefully she's spending it in the community. But I don't know if anybody's really been able to tackle that issue yet, because it's fairly new for most places. And, you know, a lot of small towns don't have most towns, yeah. so they need that as well. And it might be a little different in each place, but when somebody finds the solution, uh, let us know, but I, I know some cities have put moratoriums on more because so many units have come online and, and it's not helping with our housing prices. So. But we do know, we did a survey of all of our Main Street communities nationwide based on vacancies on upper stories and in our downtowns. And across our whole network, we have the capability of doing 60,000 housing units. So there's space out there for us to create the housing too. And so we bring that message to the federal government to say we need to have more funds that will help us in these small communities to get this housing started because it already exists. The space already exists. It needs to be rehabbed. And we need help doing that because it has to deal with fire suppression, egress, all of those things that we need to address. So we, we think there's plenty of space in our downtowns, not plenty, but a lot that we could use. And maybe that would help uh, the Airbnb market. Anything on Airbnbs for you? Well, it's a little bit different for us. Um, it's a little bit different for us because uh, our neighborhood is the place people most likely would come as tourists and, and stay. So the residents love it because now it's a source of income they didn't have before. And the tourists come in and they're like, oh my God, I can see there's this green story in the park and I got a whole lot and it's like five hundred dollars a week. So the tourists are happy, the residents are happy. Um, and so it has a different feel to it. I was gonna say in response to the earlier question about tourism, that is something we really struggle with because we don't have somebody who will drive a couple of hours from New Hampshire or Maine to go to the zoo. They'll spend the afternoon in the zoo, they'll get in the car and they'll drive all the way back, which means that they don't spend any money in the local community. They're so we've trying to figure out a different ways how do we tie visitors and tourists in the area with the local economy. You know, what our should be, for instance, is um, Boston rejected the site of the Olympics was because a lot of the venues like, like Franklin Park uh, would be closed for those time periods, but there was no evidence that the people who came there would spend any money in the community, but it would be expensive for all the infrastructure and stuff that was necessary to support them. Um, we have done things like, uh, we have an app that shows 120 historical sites. And so there's more black groups, like when the summer with the NAACP came and said, we want to spend our dollars in the black community when we go to another city. And so we're trying to create those kind of things in the community for them uh, as, as an example. But I would say all in all, uh, we have to figure out how to get the tourists to work for us. Um, yeah, so I, I do a lot of work with tourism organizations, uh, and I have I moved here from California several years ago, and in California, the Airbnb issue was like very early uh, a problem, particularly um, areas with you know major tourism uh, and hotel infrastructure. Is what I'm interested in. Um, 
So I'm seeing a lot of different types of solutions to that. Um, and you were talking about the question of available inventory for housing. If there have been formulas that are like a ratio um, where a certain amount of permits are available for Airbnb's um, based on you know the amount of vacant housing, so that if there if there is vacant housing, that people have an opportunity to utilize that as income generation. Um, and then there are also places where maybe they they want to drive a tourism strategy, but they don't have the overnight accommodation to make that a reality. So in that case, um, there you know the Airbnb's are a benefit, and so they can create programs to incentivize up to a certain number um, and create it like coalitions where they're managing that. Um, like you were mentioning, getting the the folks enrolled in the vet tax programs is always a challenge. Um, so where I've seen the city kind of see a, a person, you know, a staff member to be the person managing that. And then the collections on the vet tax um, actually goes to fund that person's position. So, you know, that it's not a, a net loss to the, the city. And actually ends up being a net gain in most um, situations. So, Okay. Are you trying one more? Yeah, we can. 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 Of the sources of equity or the state funding programs or the government program. Because they all happen with money, right? Unless you have a foreign profit or some great standard. And we're left in Rhode Island, which has the great ones. I think that there needs to be more advocacy from Main Street Americans helping with different programs make them simpler for the developers to get into these communities. And the debt comes up, right? I don't want the developers to leave with all the money and all the outside. But some of these projects are just you pencil them out, any of which way to cut them up. And they're never going to work without subsidies because they're going to lay for the contingent model. Unless we get more you know, better tax stabilization, uh, better state historic tax credit programs. Uh, thank God for the federal and states that currently exist because a lot of these good buildings So I think that you know intelligent, strong groups like yours, Main Street America, and all the individual groups that we heard from today. That advocacy is critical, whether it's promoting or public tax credit, because sometimes you have to look at the people and owners and be like, well, oh, you're like, I know you have to pay. You set up the table, the wheels, and it's not a lot, right? You just can't do anything. So, the statement and the question the question is, have you guys thought about it in your advocacy? Yeah, we, we certainly have. And, and I think I mentioned this morning that our former president and CEO is working on a small deals initiative uh, right now. Mainly it's going to be projects under five million that we're working on. And she has been reaching out to like foundations. You know, there's a lot of college foundations that have money sitting around that they don't need to get the same kind of return on investment as getting a developer to take a chance. We're trying to get EDA money. Uh, 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 we're trying to get, uh, we're trying to look at every possible source that we can. And as I mentioned, we were also looking at trying to get the historic tax credit raised to the federal rehab tax credit raised to 30% in small towns. Um, and so we're we're looking, we're almost looking. Um, we're almost smart. We'll, we'll be marching on the hill. We'll be informing people. But I agree with you completely. We, we could be doing a lot more, and more assistance is needed. I don't know if you have anything. Yet. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Uh, we, can, we can never do enough to I think, incentivize these new buildings and incentivize the projects that have been out So, the more that we can do, we've been definitely working on that in Vermont. Um, you know, one, one program, and it's been mentioned, but the state historic tax credit program in Vermont has been really been instrumental uh, on top of the federal program to really um, lower the barrier. It's not the only rule, but it's a big one. This year, we're going for a big move. We've been incrementally increasing it. I think it's up to like four and a half million a year. And we, we constantly, you know, don't have enough money to fund all the good projects that are happening. They're trying to, I don't think it's going to happen, but they're, they're trying to get them to basically release the cap of funding and just allow it to fund the projects to qualify. We can really make it bigger than um, I think it's a big push. I don't know if they achieve that, but. Um, like I said, that's, that's one school that's worked really well in Vermont. Um, you know, there's others. I mean, obviously, tax legalization uh, can be really effective um, in some other communities. You know, and, and the tax increment, increment financing is another tool that's helpful. So I think it's, um, I encourage you to talk to uh, you know, MS Development and Bob Stevens and Associates uh, around the world. They, they've really been tackling some complicated, uh, large historical preservation projects in Vermont. Um, and it's happened in dozens of different kind of funding stacks to make those projects. Uh, one of the benefits for Connecticut's uh, Supreme Court is that it program to be a 501c3 and not housed in our state department of economic and community development is it frees up um, us to navigate and uh, our community tell us that is the one of the things that they value among the most the things that we offer them is the fact that we uh, advocate for them uh, we have an annual advocacy survey that we send around and we use those results to talk to legislators about things that we can do. Uh, we do research and present them with uh, things that other states are doing that can help assist those challenges. Uh, and we have developed a relationship. Our legislature has a main street working group that is co-chaired by two representatives. And you know, we have an opportunity for them to listen to us, and that's really important. So having a coordinating program that can hear from everyone and running up the flagpole is really critical for seeing more state level funding and removing barriers that exist because of, you know, maybe antiquated rules around certain practices. All right, let's give our all of you know, the chance. <laughs> Awful lot of information today. Um, I do want to use a five minutes to tell you about uh, one more project that I just I I feel needs needs to find it and then that's it. the video. Okay. All right, then we can take a visit. Okay. So um, I have we have a video. It's called the Transformation of Grove Hall a Case Study. You can find it on YouTube and it explains how using the Main Street approach, we transform the neighborhood that you heard us talk about today. And it's much better than anything I've done today. We have a nice produce, et cetera, et cetera. So again, Transformation Pro Hall on YouTube. There you go. So I, I do also want to extend a huge thank you to all of you for being here today. You all are the best at this game. And so yeah. it's a cell ground to call it tonight. And you know, it's a much easier thing for being here. Uh, I will uh, remind you, if you came in late, that um, there is a advocacy participation survey that I would request everyone to fill out and let us know are you going to join us as a leader, a supporter, or be an in a corner to help us get this started to run. We need everybody. Um, so you sure we have an email address so that you can get our specific Main Street Rhode Island emails, which will be separate from Growth Mark starting next year. Um, and keep your eyes um, out for our monthly virtual uh, roundtable session. So, with that, I invite anyone to still have any energy left to come join us in your hall. Uh, our state of the amazing uh, craft brewery, um, public craft brewery businesses that are located. Thank you so much for coming.